Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I would like to introduce our moderator, Mr. Dex Yuan. Dex is a security professional with over 20 years of security experience in both public and private sectors. His career includes law enforcement work with the Singapore Police Force, regional security responsibilities with US MNCs, being part of the pioneer security team of Singapore's first integrated resort, and part of one of the largest critical infrastructures in Singapore. He is currently the director, principal trainer, and consultant at Security 4.0. He is also assistant regional vice president of Region 13B with ACES International. DEX has also been providing outcome-based security contract training and consultancy services since 2019. Over to you, DEX. Can you hear me, Rovi? Can you can hear me? Eh? Yeah. We can hear you okay. great. Yeah, thank you, Chloe. And thank you for the introductions. Now, the first webinar on outcome-based contract organized by Sam was last year, November 2020. And it's about a year and very timely for this second webinar. And this time around, the event is organized jointly by Sam and USC, the Union of Security Employees. It's my honor and privilege to moderate this afternoon's webinar. Since 2018, the outcome-based security contracting model was introduced in Singapore. It is one of the initiatives under the Singapore Industry Transformation Map. We have made progress in the past three years. Some of the significant milestones include the publication of the Guide on Outcome-Based Contract by MHA in 2018. And also since May 2020, all government agencies are required to adopt the OBC model. OBC was launched prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. And when COVID-19 came to our shore in 2019, it has impact individuals, businesses, and the economy. The situation is still evolving as we strive to adapt to a new normal. The security industry is not spared from this crisis. How has COVID-19 affected the adoption and implementation of OBC? Did it create new opportunities or new threats to the OBC initiative? This afternoon, together with our speakers and panelists, we are going to discuss and discover OBC in the new normal. Our first, our first speaker is Kelvin Goh, Managing Director of Sovereign Private Limited. Prior to his current position, he was a veteran in the private security industry and has served in senior positions in several other top security agencies, including Certis Cisco and Pico Guards Private Limited. Today, Kelvin will share with us his expertise on this topic, the use of technology with the reduction in manpower for residential projects. Over to you, Kelvin. Hi, thank you, Dex, for the introduction. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Kelvin. Uh, I've been tasked today to speak about the, uh, the, a topic uh, that's related to outcome-based contracting uh, in the new normal. And uh, uh, sorry, can everyone hear me? Yeah, can, right? Okay, thanks. All right, uh, so uh, before I go on, uh, let me just start to share my slides. And uh, okay, can everyone see my slides? Good, all good, thank you. Okay, um, well, the topic for discussion today uh, that I'll be presenting is uh, the use of technology with the reduction of manpower in residential projects. Uh, but in truth, uh, the, 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 the way that I do things, uh, the use of technology to reduce manpower is not restricted only to residential projects. We have done this uh, successfully for uh, industrial as well as some of the commercial projects that we are looking at as well. But today, I'll just limit my scope to um, really on uh, a case study that I've done uh, a couple of years ago uh, for residential projects. Uh, we did this about two years ago. Okay, now, uh, so uh, before I go a little bit further, let me just introduce a little bit about my company. Um, my company is uh, a listed company uh, under uh, Secura Group Limited. Uh, we are one-stop uh, integrated security solution. So we do mainly manpower, uh, which forms the main bulk of uh, my job. Uh, we also do things like a security consultancy, which is actually quite uh, uh, tied uh, to the job that we are looking at because uh, we are looking at uh, trying to introduce uh, security technology, but uh, without really doing a proper 
TVRA and coming up with a security plan, you really can't uh, come up with a good solution for the clients. So we actually have a security consultancy arm where we actually have uh, consultants. And uh, I myself is one of the uh, accredited uh, security consultant as uh, uh, able to do consultancy works as well. And we also have an SI company uh, where we actually uh, give uh, the technology um, side of things for our clients. Uh, it's all done in-house by, by my um, SI company. Uh, we do security training and, and uh, quite a lot of other aspects of, secu of security. But uh, the, the, the few main focuses that I'm looking at is security guarding, consultancy and integration, uh, systems integration that I'll be talking about today. All right, uh, before I go further, uh, we look at the, I've looked at the future of security uh, for a couple of years now. Um, so this tagline that was actually um, put up in today's newspaper, uh, today online, with the technology being a game changer across various security uh, sectors, the security industry is not spared. Indeed, this is true. Um, the use of technology has uh, been uh, growing very fast uh, over the last couple of years, I think name, uh, namely because um, the internet, uh, the speed of the internet has gone way faster. Technology has gone way better. Uh, we're talking about um, video analytics being very possible right now as compared to 10, 15 years ago when I came into the industry and uh, it's not really very a viable a solution. So what we did uh, a couple of years ago uh, for my own command center is that uh, we've actually uh, evolved our command center from a center for security situation awareness where we were only monitoring um, the sites that we were guarding. And uh, it was really passive monitoring where we use um, um, analog cameras and we look at the guard houses and some of the, the sites that we look at to uh, right now uh, in 2017 I actually built a command center uh, for my uh, in, in my new building and mainly focused on things like remote monitoring of the sites that we are monitoring uh, we're doing analysis and rapid response for our clients as well as remote access control where we um, do the access control in my FCC instead of uh, on site so uh, just some of the things that we've done uh, over the years in 2019, I've actually showcased this to PM Lee during the security industry showcase, where we showed uh, PM Lee the technology that we have in our company, what we uh, are doing in my command center, the different types of technology and the, uh, integra uh, the integrated intelligence system platform that we have that uh, enables us to actually bring in all the different uh, types of monitoring that we have and uh, actually come up with a SOP, uh, a response uh, to the incidents that happen on the ground and it's all done using the intelligence system that we have. So we've also showcased this to uh, uh, DPM uh, Heng Sui Kiet, uh, I think about a couple of months after that, uh, during the WSG's job redesign for security program. And uh, you know, we've actually showcased the same uh, technology that we have using uh, different types of uh, sensors and also the response that uh, my guys do on the ground. So this is uh, my command center and uh, this is my respond, uh, one of my response team guys. So now let me go into the topic that I'm here to talk about today. The use of technology with the reduction of manpower in residential projects. So what we told the client that we wanted to do, in, this, in essence, is we wanted to give them a cost-effective security solutions. So we're not only going to come in there and talk to the client about uh, just giving me the headcount uh, uh, that you need and just providing them with that. Uh, we, are, we are here to actually provide the customers with cost-effective security solutions. So we are looking at technology, we're looking at manpower, we are looking at process changes. So of course, uh, we want to make sure that uh, the, the people and the assets are protected with real-time intervention. That's something that's very different from uh, the past uh, way of doing security. So the current security approach uh, that we see in the market nowadays, uh, even till now, is there's a heavy reliance on manpower. So a lot of security uh, vendors, they are primarily headcount-based uh, security contracts. So uh, even buyers are, are not really um, able to look at uh, the integration of technology into the manpower uh, uh, contract. So uh, this is something that's really new uh, because uh, in the past uh, where clients per procure security, they usually procure security separately, security systems and security manpower, and they like to separate the two. Uh, so that's the, the old way of doing um, security. And uh, we, we are now actually endeavoring to, to move into the new way of doing things where we, we, we actually come up with proper um, TVRAs and security plans, which actually includes technology, manpower, and process changes to the sites. So let me just go into that. Okay, so what we did was that uh, for one of my clients, uh, is Esmond Height Condominium. 
we actually went in to propose to them the appropriate security measures to enhance the security of the, 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 the Aspen Height condo. So what we did was we, we wanted to reduce the reliance on manpower. We want to manage rising costs of security using technology because uh, we all know that in Singapore, with the PWM rising for the um, security sector, the wages of security officers has been increasing and therefore the uh, manpower costs to our clients has been increasing. So this is not a very sustainable way of, uh, of uh, doing business, uh, even for myself, uh, because it's just not enough security officers on the ground to provide to the clients. So uh, since 2017, my company has actually already gone into technology and we've been trying to sell uh, the concept to our clients where we tell them that, look, um, let me do a proper TVRA and a proper security plan for you uh, so that you'll be able to see uh, whether there, there's any way that we can actually increase the efficiency of security operations and uh, to actually bring down the uh, manpower costs needed in order to uh, you know, meet the same security outcome or even better. So what we did was that we recommended security um, measures such as the provision of guarding, access control procedures, remote surveillance, uh, SOPs for the safety and security of this particular premise that we did. So I'm going to share uh, a little bit into how we started doing things and how we actually did it and the security outcome that we actually achieved. So uh, when it came to the physical protection systems design consideration, we used the widely used um, 4D 1R uh, concept, which is the uh, layered protection concept of deter. We want to deter uh, any perpetrators. We want to detect, we want to delay, and we want to deny. And lastly, for uh, response to be done. So I'll just go quite briefly into this. All right, so in uh, the site uh, that I'm particularly talking about today, uh, we've managed to reduce the manpower from 10 manpower for the whole day to eight manpower. Uh, and we've managed to, so we managed to reduce uh, one SSO and one SO uh, for the whole day. So when we went through um, this project, we went through with the clients, with their needs, we, we looked at the areas concern that they have. This is, this is predominantly what we do. We do an actual proper DVRA for them. So we go through the clients, we take their inputs on uh, what they want us to look at and uh, their, their concerns and also whatever concerns that we, we, we flag up. So of course, uh, for, for here, we look at from uh, the outer perimeter then towards the inner side of the premise. So we started off with things like the guard houses. There's, two, there's actually two guard houses which we looked at. So there's, also, there's always the walk-in and the drive-in access control that we need to look at, uh, where at, uh, before I took over the project, they were doing purely just using the guards to to you know, look at uh, drive-in and walk-ins. And, uh, and they have things, they have some areas of concern such as the driveways where people, where the, uh, where the children are actually uh, illegally scooting around on the driveways and they want us to uh, you know, um, deter the kids from doing that. So we, we help them do this. And also they have a playground, they have a misuse of tennis court, they have a putting green where uh, in the condominium where the, the, the children are, you know, uh, messing around there. So they wanted us to actually look into these areas for them. And of course, um, the barbecue pit, the clubhouse, uh, swimming pool, that's the usual things that condominiums are, are, are concerned with. So what we did, uh, we actually went in there, we do a proper TBRA for them. Um, sorry. We, so we, we started off with the guard houses, we looked at walk-ins, um, we, we did our findings, we then put our recommendations to the clients. So um, for the guard houses, uh, uh, where people walk in, uh, they walk in usually through the side gate, uh, for what so what we, we notice is that it's very vulnerable to tailgating. And it's very difficult for the security to monitor because the guardhouse is although it's beside it, uh, but usually the security officers are looking at the vehicles coming in, and this uh, is on the other side of the guardhouse, so it's kind of difficult to 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 monitor for the guards in the guardhouse. So what we propose, we would propose to have CCTV with VA and facial recognition even. Uh, of course, we also suggested to put in uh, signages to remind visitors to actually report at the guard houses. Uh, these, are the, these are the recommendations we put up then. And uh, the actual implementation was that the client actually accepted the CCTV intrusion uh, video analytics. So this is an example of uh, what we did, what we recommended, and this is the actual outcome that the client actually uh, made us, uh, in, let us implement. So uh, I'll just go through um, some of the, 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 the crucial points that we, we went through. So then the, the vehicle out lane, you know, uh, same thing, they, they had issues of people walking in through the vehicle out lanes and uh, they were concerned with uh, uh, people walking in. As, as I shared earlier, uh, on, if you can look at the picture on the right-hand side, you see that the, there's a vehicle lane, but you know, because the guards are always looking at the vehicle coming in instead of the vehicles walking out, going out lane. So 
people tend to walk in through the uh, the vehicle out lane and uh, you know the security officers usually miss it so what we did was uh, we actually implemented cctv with video analytics uh, and this uh, this all these alerts goes back to the scc where it's monitored by the security supervisor on duty security supervisor then uh, communicates with the officers in the guardhouse and the officers in the guardhouse are able to you know stop people from doing uh the the the, the, the illegal walk-ins so uh earlier i shared the driveway where they had illegal uh scooting and illegal parking so these are areas where we actually did up uh, video analytics for them uh so we are able to spot and then we send in the patrolling officer uh to to go and catch the the people doing that so for another area of concern is actually the drop-off points at the blocks. This is a very common problem for condominiums. During peak hours, there's a need to make sure that you know the vehicle control is, is fast. And you can't have vehicles being parked there for long, you know, or, you know, uh, vehicles parked there and then the, 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 the drivers walk away and the vehicles just left there. So what we did was that we actually implemented CCTV with VA. Uh, the, once the stationary object is there for more than two minutes, it triggers and we are able to respond to it. So same thing for barbecue pit, uh, clubhouses where there's people uh, playing around there, messing around, the, especially the children and getting themselves hurt. So what we did was that we actually implemented CCTV VA. Uh, SCC looks at it, uh, then sends in the patrol officer, the patrolling officer if needed to uh, actually chase them away. And uh, there's also the, the driving range. Uh, well, this condominium has a lot more facilities that they were they, they, they're having problems with. So we actually went into every single one of them with them. And then we propose uh, different uh, things. So like, for example, the putting green, uh, uh, the children usually like to play at the putting green, they play soccer and all that. So uh, instead of sending my guard to just keep walking there all the time, we actually also implemented uh, speakers, PA system for our officers to be able to talk to the kids, uh, tell them uh, don't, don't play there, you know, uh, 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 it's dangerous for them and stuff. Yeah, and then uh, the, the, sorry. And then there's also the squash card problem where people um, use it without booking, you know. Uh, so we have actually uh, implemented system such as access control system just to lock up the, the squash cards uh, and uh, CCTV, of course, to make sure that, you know, during uh, uh, timings where the facility is not booked and there's not, not supposed to be anybody there, uh, we're able to see from the FCC and to respond to it. Uh, the putting green, uh, VA with uh, with uh, speakers. Same thing for the playground because uh, there's been some incidents of children falling down at the playground. They actually wanted us to look at it. So uh, as I was saying earlier, um, we actually use speakers to warn the children. So the procedure that we worked out with the client was that the SEC will monitor children's behavior, give two verbal warnings, and then do enf the enforcement officers would then be dispatched to uh, to go um, you know chase the children away. So this is, this is the, the, the technology that we use, uh, simple, effective. Then uh, for the access control for vehicles and humans walking in, we actually chose to adopt uh, the license plate recognition system to actually simplify the registration process. And uh, we're able to record and search uh, vehicles coming in and out from the premise. So in the past, when this was done, uh, it was done manually. Uh, we had to record every single car that comes in manually and even physical visitors coming in, same thing. So uh, what we proposed to do for the client was that we actually put in the license plate recognition systems and VMS systems. So it actually led to a reduced time taken to record visitors, contractors uh, from three minutes because we timed it uh, to a very effective 30 seconds. So we managed to clear vehicles really fast and uh, in many estates as well, um, there's also this usually this this uh, requirement by condominiums to actually record down drop-offs as well or taxis, you know, coming in to fetch people. So with the LPR system, it became very easy for us to record because the LPR quickly captures the license plate. And when we ask the visitor uh, what the purpose of the visit and they say drop-off, we just click under comments as drop-off. So we have a record of every single vehicle coming in and it's done very fast. Uh, so we did this for both the guard houses. There was guard house one, and this is for guard house two. We did the same thing. We did uh, license license plate recognition system and visitor management system. So in all, uh, these are the the things that we did. We managed to look at uh, things such uh, such as the deployment of the officers. We rearranged it a little bit. We reduced the manpower needed. Uh, we put in a lot of technologies that's needed. Uh, simple but effective technology that's not really very costly uh, for the clients, and uh, we managed to get pretty much the same 
uh, security outcome, but actually uh, much better security outcome because uh, we managed to clear things like traffic uh, jamming up at the uh, gut houses, uh, which is a usual complaint from the client. So we, so we managed to do things like that uh, using simple technology uh, and it's all monitored centrally by my command center uh, remotely. Uh, for this client, we don't do uh, uh, we 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 don't we we only offer them the service of response officer if needed. Uh, so that's that's what we did for this condominium. Uh, okay, that's all I have for my presentation. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Kelvin, for the very interesting case study sharing. And I'm sure this is very relevant to all of us here. I think some of us are staying in condominiums or other uh, residential places, but not just residential areas. No, What Kelvin has just shared with us is also applicable for other locations like commercial buildings. So I'm sure there's some value for every one of you. Now, in fact, some of you has already started posting questions. Yes. So please uh, post your questions in the Q&A. If uh, you have any specific questions, we'll come to the panel discussion at the end of these sessions. So just go to the Q&A there, just type in, be more specific. And if your question is directed at certain speakers, you may state so also. If not, then uh, during the discussion, we just open to all the speakers. Now, moving on next. Our speaker is, our next speaker is Steve Tan. He's the Executive Sec Secretary of the Union of Security Employees, USE. And USE is one of the 59 unions in Singapore affiliated to the National Trips Union Congress. As the Executive Secretary of USE, Steve was involved in the introduction of progressive wage border in 2014 for security officers which raised their basic wages from $800 to $1,250 today. USC was also actively involved in the creation and launch of the industry transformation map for the sector for the security sector in 2018, including leading one of the work groups at its launch. Today, Steve will share with us on the topic Support for Security Ops Tech Integration at SACS. Steve, over to you. Thank you very much, Dax. And uh, good afternoon to all our participants, as well as our, my fellow panel. Uh, the last time we spoke a year ago, I think uh, we weren't expecting uh, that a year later we'll still be meeting in this uh, manner. In fact, uh, we're very happy to co-present this with uh, SAMS, our very, very hardworking uh, events partners who started planning a offline event two years ago, right? So I think two years later, uh, very much a lot of our activities is still online. So uh, uh, I'm sure the next time we do this, uh, we can uh, look at perhaps a multimodal way of a presentation. So a lot has moved since the last time we met up and uh, in uh, Dex's introdu introduction, uh, we mentioned the progressive which uh, last year was uh, 1250. So now it's already 1004 and we'll be moving on uh, from strength to strength, All right? So let me call out my uh, short presentation, just 10 slides to share with uh, everyone. And uh, okay, so, um, let me just get the screen in order. Okay, great. Uh, so just a little background on uh, Union of Security Employees. Uh, we are one of the unions that are affiliated to NTUC, established in 1978. Uh, we represent all persons employed in the security and security related services. We have 20,000 members uh, now and uh, almost half the industry, uh, what we call unionized uh, under USE. So this is uh, one of the reasons why we want to collaborate with SAMS to actually uh, push out uh, more messages. Uh, in fact, uh, new ways of doing uh, private security to all our service buyers so that we can establish a win-win, not just from the officer's perspective, but also from the buyers as well as the agency's perspective. So the union is part of two key tripartite committees. So the emphasis here is less of the union, but more so the tripartite committees. Yeah? There are two tripartite committees. One is actually uh, spearheaded by MOM. That's called the security tripartite cluster. And because it is MOM, naturally the focus is on wages. 
right, and skills. The other committee is uh, spearheaded by the Ministry of uh, Home Affairs. So because MHA oversees the pol Singapore Police Force, which oversees the sector's regulation of uh, industry capabilities, the ITM committee, right, Security Industry Transformation Map Committee, therefore focuses on increasing the security outcomes of security contracts in Singapore, and through that, providing good jobs for Singapore. Not careers of last resort, but a career of choice, right? So uh, as uh, I think Dex has uh, recounted, uh, the PWM for our industry started in 20, uh, announced in 2014, started to be implemented from 2016, and we have moved from strength to strength. Prior to us talking about PWM, basic wages were 800. But actually many years ago, basic wages were actually higher than 800. But what had happened over the years was because of a market failure, uh, the, the contracts were basically bidding based on cheaper manpower basis. And as a result, wages went down and the quality of security actually went down. So PWM has four ladders, which is a ladder, a proper career pathway is a ladder, Skill set is a ladder, and most importantly, productivity is also a ladder inside the PWM. In the ITM committee, the key focus was actually the security ITM map strategies that are listed here, uh, the small uh, section here. One of the key things here you see is best sourcing, or we call it outcome-based contracting now. Outcome-based contracting is very clearly contracting based on outcome. It is uh, changing the philosophy of outsourcing security by basing your evaluation on the cheapest manpower code that you get. It is first focusing on the security outcome that we want, installing the right technology to harden the site, and then put in the suitably trained manpower to leverage the technology. So this, uh, we have uh, started to push out to the industry since 2018. And uh, the police force actually has a department that specifically uh, manages the rollout of OBC to the buyer community at large. So for U USE, what we have done is uh, we have put together a framework to support uh, our security agencies and buyers site by site, right? So unlike, uh, say, uh, different industry where you can transform simply by the factory, adopting a transformation strategy. I think for security, it takes us a little bit more elbow grease. We have to go site by site because every site, the security uh, requirement is different. As Calvin has mentioned, you need to do a proper TVRA. Each site, the TVRA considerations are different depending on the value of the property, the lives in the property, the situation the property is in and so on. So what we have done is we put together a three layer uh, pyramid to support. Uh, our agencies and the buyers. Base level is uh, the blue color label one. So this is typically all the generic skill sets that uh, an agency needs to start securing the site. So officers need to complete their basic licensing unit. Officers who are resistant to technology or fear technology, which is actually less than 20% based on our current survey, we can actually help, uh, help, help them go through a skills future digital workplace uh, course which uh, allows them to understand how technology works and uh, specific technologies of our sector, like body-worn camera are used to teach them uh, how to actually uh, do, use, use those technology in the course of their work. Level two in, the, in green is what we call a semi-customized approach, where we work with the agency and the buyer for the site and say, look, is there anything specific that you are of concern with. And what we have learned is that there are uh, sites which say that actually the security officer, whilst doing security is good, we would like them to help us cover specific areas. One site we worked on, the area was about using a building management system, BMS, right? So the building's own technical crew, they do a, a nine to five, nine to six shift. And after work, there's no one who knows how to use the BMS. And as a result, sometimes urgent diagnosis of problems, uh, they have called back someone and wait for the person to travel back in within two hours, so and so forth. 
So by training the security officers to also be able to use BMS to diagnose problems and calling in the right parties to resolve the problems, that saves time and increase operational effectiveness. And of course, for our officers who are so-called cross-trained, we actually ask them to be paid better through a tap pay, similar to the concept of uh, in the army, right? Where you are trained with extra skill, you get an extra tap pay, and uh, you carry that tap with you. At the highest level, level three, this is fully customized. There's no user manual for us. So each site is different. Some sites actually say, I need a quick response force. None of the security officers are actually trained to ride a motorbike. So we send them for a class 2B training so that they can actually do quick response using the, the motorbike. There are yet other sites that say, I need the workers to be trained to do electrical works. So it's either a licensed electrical worker training or a customized training that we work with the building owners to implement in a, in a manner that is satisfactory to all parties. So the good news about this uh, framework is that there are, there's funding, right? So the good thing about operating in Singapore generally is that uh, funding is uh, quite uh, readily available. So naturally, there is the government side of funding where you have the uh, WSG, Workforce Singapore's uh, J Job Redesign Reskilling Fund. So USE is one of the distributors of the fund. So we actually help to put these programs uh, onto uh, that funding source. NTUC also has a set of funds. I won't go into the details, but essentially it layers on top of the government funding. And then USC, of course, we support our unionized companies with extra funding at all levels. So essentially for the buyers, it represents a low risk approach to work with their agency to try going on outcome based rather than saying that I continue to say, I want 10 men, 10 men in a day, 10 men in the night, you give me one less, I will LD you. I think that is really an archaic way of doing things. We have been explaining and explaining over the years that if the buyer's main way of controlling security outcome is through levying a fine called a liquidated damages, you are essentially not going to get the best outcome because no one is happy being fined. And if you have to do the job because you have no choice, if not, you'll get fined, then I think the security outcome and productivity would actually be at the very, very low operational level. Yeah? So what we have done is, other than putting together a framework, we have uh, gone out, right? We organized tech manpower catalyst sessions to allow agencies that are manpower-centric to work with tech vendors, co-invest in solutions, and roll them out to their buyers. We have organized buyer seminars like this one, to reach out to more than 600 buyers now, if we keep adding those sessions that we've been doing, especially online, uh, basically to explain to buyers that there are companies in Singapore and uh, there are sites in Singapore that have already implemented outcome based and saved tremendously. And most importantly, their security outcome has increased significantly. Union management dialogues, basically we are uh, bringing consultants to help uh, explain uh, what, what are the funding structures, as well as uh, how to do TVRAs, what to look out for in specific site designs, uh, site security designs. So we have also organized these courses, as mentioned just now in the pyramid. So these are happy participants who have taken part. So for example, skills future digital workplace for security, customized at the base level, uh, that means generic level, $10 per person. So it is very, very affordable and we work with agencies to send their officers for this training. We also have the fundamentals of building services and safety because this was what one of the sites actually required the officers to go through. They had water leaking the whole night. Huh? And the officer, when he found, found the water leaking, it's not a simple pipe change. Huh? It's quite complex. So he doesn't know how to fix it, right? His SOP is to call in the plumber who has a two-hour respond time. So on a weekend, sometimes the two hours become four hours and you lose four hours of water. So now the security officers are actually trained to do remedy immediately. They see leaking pipes. They can actually at least turn off the mains. They see a broken fluorescent bulb, high risk. They can at least turn off the mains, do simple repairs. These are all warranted 
local warranty given by the buyer of the security services, right? So here we have a senior security officer, Shabir, who actually explains uh, his thoughts, right? From attending our FBSS course. Okay, so just a uh, last part to round it off. Uh, USE is, uh, also runs a mediation service. Uh, this is uh, together with uh, TADEM Tripartite Alliance for Dispute Management. So TADEM handles dispute management for the whole Singapore. Specific for security industry is operated by us. So the reason why we want to do so is because number one, we want to resolve in industry disputes that I think because we are in the industry, we know how it works. Sometimes it's faster, it's quicker, and uh, we have trust from both sides, uh, employer and employee. And importantly also is that this mediation service actually helps us resolve some of these disputes that actually can be solved with outcome-based contracting. So interesting, right? Mediation dispute, how come can become outcome-based? Because sometimes this the disputes is not between the officer and the agency, but it's between the officer agency and the resident, for example, of a condo, right? So if that happens, we actually come in to say that, look, uh, whilst we can solve this, uh, sometimes it's a verbal abuse, sometimes physical abuse, will involve the police or whatsoever if it is very, very serious. But the fundamental cause will never go away if the job is not redesigned. If, let's say, the property says after 10 p.m., anybody comes in, you need to pay $10, $20 to park overnight. And the job is given to the officer to chase down every car to collect the $10 in person. You are basically asking the officer every night to be provoked, to provoke people and to be challenged. So we explain to the client in one such instance that actually it's far more effective just putting in the gantry. Doesn't cost you much to recover back through a cash card deduction. You know? The person does not need an explanation. He will not lose face to his guest whom he's driving in at the same time. Hey, how come you stay in this condo? You still need to pay $20, things like that. We just avoid that totally because the machine does the talking, right? So we have also seen illegal parking being uh, handled by just changing it from officer having to handle it face to face to just a movable screen, a robot equivalent that goes around and say, thank you, sir, you cannot park here. We are already recording this footage. Please move along, yeah? So these are the further value add that we provide to our, uh, the industry, unionized companies, security agencies, and buyers, right? Faster info, access to PWM, which will be changing soon. So to all our buyers listening in, uh, we will be announcing new PWM wages soon because the original, uh, or rather the second uh, release in 2017 covers until 2023. So we now need to start uh, looking at wages for 2024 and the wages will go up significantly, right? The key thing is because we are short of manpower. The whole Singapore's demographics that we have seen in the newspaper two days ago is shrinking. There's just not enough manpower for us to con continue to deploy manpower in the heavily manpower-centric way that we have been used to. Yeah, So we have to change that. We have to use a transformative approach to buying security. Okay, so these are some resources available on our website. Please feel free to browse them and I'll be very, very happy to take any questions that you have. Thank you very much for allowing me to share. Hey, thank you. Thank you, Steve, for the wonderful sharing. I think there's lots of information you have shared with us. You know? I've taken a lot of notes. And what particular uh, uh, quote you mentioned, I, I like it very much, the career of choice. I think that is very wonderful, career of choice you know, to join security. This is very good. Maybe you should start doing some marketing about this. <laughs> and I think the other part, very useful information you share with us is the PWN wages. And I noted that you say it's going to increase significantly. Huh? So I think that's a key words for everybody here, because especially if you are going to be a, you are a buyer, it's going to affect your pocket, your budget. So this is something to look out for. Okay, so uh, yeah, looking at the comments, uh, the chat, I, I, I can see many of you are typing into the chat and uh, all the compliments, uh, all the comments. It is very encouraging. Please to continue to put in your comments there to give encouraging remarks okay, to our speakers. Then they will share more things with you. <laughs> okay. Now, moving on. 
Now we will go to our panel discussions. And before we move into that, let me introduce you to uh, additional panelists who will be joining us as well here today. First is Mr. Jeffrey Chua. He is the co-chairman of the Tripartite Committee for Security and Cleaning Industry. Jeffrey was also the former Senior Managing Director of Operations for Capital Land Singapore and has over three decades of experience in property and facilities management. And we also have a lady with us today, to this afternoon. She is Madeline Bay, Acting Head of Contracts and Procurements, Business Park Singapore Operations with Ascenders Private Limited. Madeline has over 16 years of experience in the construction and real estate industry and oversees the procurement and facility, procurement of facility services for over 100 capital land properties. Wow, so many. Okay. Across various portfolios in Singapore. So thank you so much for joining us. We will now proceed with our uh, panel session. But firstly, okay, firstly, we have already heard from Kelvin and Steve. Huh? Probably I would like to first uh, post the question to Jeffrey and Madeline. Huh? So let's hear them out first. This is a, a simple question. Probably can you share with us what's your experience huh, with this outcome-based security contract based on your any of your contacts? Huh? Uh, maybe ladies first. Huh? Let's go with Madeline. Can you just share with us, probably in just two minutes, okay? just give us an overview of your experience with OBC. I think originally when the, our company, same with the rest, we are on this uh, headcount base. I think in 2016, the PWN starts to roll. The security was hit, hit quite hard. So the management decided that and, uh, under the leadership of uh, Mr. Jeffrey Chua, we went ahead and convinced the stakeholders to move on with the performance base. But it, it takes a few, uh, it takes a while. It really takes a while because everything is new to the industry and the, the vendor probably wouldn't have uh, understand the characteristics of your entity. It took some time for them to understand uh, the nature of your, uh, the expectation, the requirement based on headcount base. And we actually took a while to slowly change it, uh, switch it to, we call them performance based. We didn't really use the outcome based model per se. So ours was more on the performance based uh, um, kind of contract with the vendors. So across the property, we actually sector it in accordance to the, the type of the cluster, logistics type or the science park type. So it took a while to, to uh, have the performance base uh, roll out across the 100 over properties. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Madeline, for sharing that. And um, hopefully later on, we'll hear more about your uh, some of these experience uh, over the 100 over properties. Yes. Uh, next, let's hear from Mr. Jeffrey. Maybe I just, uh, hi everyone. Um, good afternoon to everyone. Good to see such a very good response uh, uh, for this seminar. Uh, when I was first invited to speak, um, uh, I was told to share our experience in rolling out performance-based contract. In fact, we are one of the early uh, adopters of these uh, contracts. We started with cleaning first, uh, and then uh, after it has been successfully rolled out, then we started to roll out for security. Um, cleaning industry was more prepared for outcome-based contract. Uh, we, we, when we socialized with the cleaning industry, we had ample uh, response from service providers who says we are ready to go, we have a system in place, we have a way to evaluate the cleaning standards, and we are prepared to roll out a performance-based contract with you. Uh, security took a while, primarily from two points of view. Uh, uh, first, uh, it was new to the industry then. Uh, and secondly, our asset owners and buyers and stakeholders and even our tenants were used to see, seeing physical warm bodies on, in our buildings. Uh, so managing expectation was critical. Uh. We had to first convince our asset owners who who hold the first string and budget that this is in with something you had no choice because the PWM has started to kick in already. If you were to go ahead with outcome-based uh, headcount contract, it's going to cost you at least 30-40% more than what you used to be. Uh, I'm glad they went ahead. Uh, they also agreed that 
as an owner, we should also invest and upgrade our properties with some, some form of technology. So we put in uh, CCTVs with VA, uh, VA capabilities. Uh, you heard earlier from uh, Kelvin uh, from Severus uh, that they introduce it by way of a service buyer. We went to introduce it by way of uh, owner. Uh, we thought it's important to prepare our incumbent security agencies uh, that please be familiar with what, you, what we have deployed, use it, and we give them a bit more time for them to adjust to outcome-based contracts. So our contracts were like six years. Uh, we started with a headcount contract of three years with a headcount contract. Then we switched them over to performance-based. Not outcome based, performance based, because our performance base, we have built in incentive in our contract. Uh, we wanted to see savings, but we also want to incentivize them if they outperform. Uh, so by doing that, uh, it was easy to get security agencies to come along uh, and then uh, work with us to trans to pivot from hit count to outcome base. So for buyers in our audience, if you have this concern, you're not sure, you know, how you're going to manage so many stakeholders and all those things. I think you have to think ahead how you want to manage your various stakeholders and various stakeholders have different needs. Like I say, tenants want to see a physical warm body. Uh, asset owner wants to ensure that the budget is not burst. Uh, service service uh, providers want to show tell us that, hey, I can't, continue your headcount contract, let's find a way out. But I don't have technology, can you please help me? So we, we did it that way, but uh, I have seen in the last few years uh, as co-chair to both uh, the committees that Steve uh, have uh, mentioned earlier, and by the way, still the co-chair, I've seen SAs embracing technologies in a very big way. Uh, thanks to all the parties like MHA, police force, uh, IMDA for providing the grants and so on and training. There are many more SA security agency now ready to offer outcome-based contracts. There are many more security agencies that have capabilities to do command center control. When we started in 2016, there were only a few big boys out there who were able to offer such solutions. So as a buyer, I also don't want to be caught in a situation that I have very few choices, right? So, uh, as a buyer, it's, it's a point of entry in which you open up your contracting uh, uh, models, right? Because if you go in too early, you end up paying too much. If you go in too late, you're probably a late doctor, never mind, but you end up paying more. But you want to hit it at a point where there's enough service providers out there who can offer you competitive pricing. So that was our strategy. And I think it has bought us well in the last few years. I mean, incidentally, just quote some numbers. Our cleaning in this outcome-based contract in the last five years, uh, I think Madeline can com confirm, our cost has not go up, gone up more than 2%. 2%. Right. Yeah. Not more than 2% because we work in partnership with the cleaning companies to work towards outcome-based contract. And because of this, they introduce technology, robots, and so on. And that has helped manage cost increases. And similarly, for our for security uh, sector, our cost has been manageable. It has gone up, but it has not gone up in a big way because we have transited quite well. Um, earlier, Steve mentioned there's going to be an announcement soon about the PWM that is going to be uh, introduced uh, later in the later years. I urge all buyers to think seriously about outcome-based contract because really with the industry, the industry is uh, shared with us. There uh, is a big, big shortage, almost 10,000 security guards short in the industry, 10,000. And Malaysia uh, also send some of their workers over to, to Singapore to work, a lot of Malaysian workers. And with the clampdown, with the, the border, border control, it's going to be extremely difficult in the future for anyone to hope to continue with headcount contract. Uh, so if that cost is going to go up, really we have not much of a choice to go outcome based and seriously invest on technology to move forward okay so far so far that's what i want to share thanks okay thank you jeffrey that is very insightful you share a lot of things uh, with us and uh, we heard of the these two terms uh, from both uh, madeline and jeffrey performance 
based now whether performance based or outcome based i think here we are all looking at this as uh, what we call a best sourcing okay the model is uh, the concept is to get the security services based on uh, end results rather than just a specific hit count there okay and i also like the numbers the figures that shared by Jeffrey, I think that there are all the important numbers which the buyers, the decision maker want to know. Okay, increasing the cost by not more than two percent, uh, but this this is despite in the increase in the manpower cost. As uh, Steve has mentioned earlier on, um, we are expecting a significant increase in the PWM, uh, so the security cost will definitely goes up. This will definitely be going charge back to the service buyers. Okay, so now let's look at the questions from the audience that. The Q and A. I have the first questions for uh, Kelvin. Uh, since Kelvin, you are, you are the first speaker. Uh, okay. So the question is from this uh, the, this this kid, uh, thing. Okay. Um, do you face any resistance or concern from the condo MC? I think the management committee and residents regarding the deployment of face recognition system. How do you convince them? This could be some form of like privacy concern, probably. Yeah. So uh, we, we always face resistance when it comes to uh, condos. Uh, condos are actually really difficult to convince them to really move into uh, outcome-based contract or performance-based contract. Uh, that's, that's really very extreme already. Uh, but to even try to persuade them to move into uh, the use of technology, it was already a challenge. And the reason is really quite simple. Uh, in, in condos, Actually, every single resident will have a say, right? And uh, whenever we put up our proposals uh, to the council, the council has to go back, uh, you know, and usually if we, we tell them that uh, there's going to be some capex involved when it comes to the implementation of the tech, they have to go to an AGM. And, uh, you know, when they raise this up and, uh, you know, the, 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 the residents then start saying things like, you know, what Mr. Jeffrey raised earlier, they like to see warm bodies. They just don't want to see, uh, 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 you know, technology. And uh, of course, the, 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 the concern about uh, deployment for facial recognition system is especially uh, tricky. Um, to, to, I, I have not sold them the facial recognition system in the one and I, and that, I made it, that I proposed uh, in, in Aspen Heights. And uh, precisely the reason was because they feel that there's a privacy issue. They feel that uh, because uh, the, 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 the technology that uh, we, are, we are deploying, right, we'll have to have the database of uh, all the faces. Uh, they feel that there's, there's this, this, uh, this privacy issue uh, when it comes to you know, having the face uh, recorded in our database. So that, that's, that we, we face a lot of issue, uh, a lot of uh, pushbacks on that. And that's the reason why instead of going for full um, facial recognition systems, I have actually pushed uh, really harder on things like uh, other kinds of VA. I, I, don't, I don't move them into uh, facial recognition systems as access control. Yeah. Hey, thank you. That, that is really a very uh, relevant question, sir. These days we have the PTPA, we are all looking at our own uh, rights, uh, personal rights, privacy. So as a resident there, I want to know what is my rights. So this may be a concern. And probably for the similar questions, uh, Madeline may be able to share some insight truths. I, I believe you also manage some of these properties, residential or, or even commercial. Any concern with uh, this aspect of a facial recognition? Uh, we don't manage the residential, but more on the industrial and a few commercial, yes, the capital tower side. So um, for our side, our, I think the adoption of the technology was okay. The tenants-wise was quite receptive. I think it's a different class if we were to compare to a condo. So um, in terms of that aspect, we don't really face much of a resistance. Yeah. The technology was actually born by the owner, the entity, right? Okay, so they are quite receptive to it. Huh? They are quite receptive to it, yeah. The only part is that we have to engage them to queue out and do the facial recognition, the part. I think <laughs> that, was the, that was the tedious part because, you know, in a commercial building, you actually have to engage with thousands of the tenants. There's quite a lot of database, so that was just part of the hustle. Other than that, um, we don't face much of an issue. Okay. Uh, because we, we use the facial recognition also for our uh, turnstile gantry control. So it's an access control mechanism. That's why we needed to uh, register that uh, in the system. 
Yeah. I see. So, so no, no major pushback. No major pushback. Uh, uh, unlike maybe in some parts of the world where PDPA becomes a big uh, challenge, but I think in Singapore generally, people uh, accord a security more than for personal privacy. But I think you have to, the communication has to be clear. I mean, you have to you have to convince uh, that it is for the common good, uh. So I think uh, we were fortunate that our tenants didn't push back. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, just wondering, Steve, do you have anything to add on to this before I move to the next question? Thanks, 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 Dex. Uh, actually, not specifically here, but I do have a couple of uh, questions, uh, or rather I saw a couple of questions that's quite interesting to me. I don't know whether I can have your permission to answer that instead. Sure, <laughs> sure. sure. Okay. let's do so, it. Uh, I also noticed that there were some very interesting questions that perhaps... Uh, uh, Jeffrey uh, or Matt can help answer specifically on how to call the OBC contracts. I think your past experience will be very, very helpful. Some of these questions are really, really, very thoughtful. Okay, so I just covered two questions that were asked. One is how do we explain OBC to the layman? This is a very, very good question, very important question because we, we started off by talking about OBC eh, as OBC, right? So we went around everywhere uh, look, do you want to do outcome-based contract, outcome-based contract? After a while, people understand outcome-based contract, but do not understand what it meant to them, right? Because the term itself means different things to different people. So I recall uh, when we were in uh, Sweden for a learning trip a few years ago, the Swedish private security companies that met us, they were very surprised that we actually do not have outcome-based contract in Singapore. So they were in fact quite amazed that security, which has to be quite tightly regulated in most countries. Huh? They, the security outcomes is absolutely critical. Then how come in our context, we are bidding contracts as if uh, in the olden days, you know, in the 60s, right? Where we look at Jaga and we say, I want one Jaga here, one Jaga there, tell me how much. So Singapore, first world country, now in the 20 something, huh? year 2019, 2018, how come we still don't practice that? So they were very surprised. So I think uh, we have uh, changed our approach to explaining outcome-based. So in security, Singapore, there are four quadrants largely. One is residential, commercial, industrial, and public land. So for public sector, as I mentioned just now, the Singapore Police Force has a department that actually helps all the public sector go onto OBC already. By 2019 was the commitment. So the public sector contracts have largely already gone on OBC. So that one can be fully technical, right? Because there is a department full-time explaining it to them. But the other opposite is the residential one. Residential, I've attended some of these uh, briefings uh, with uh, our security agencies. I think the challenge is condo buyers are not professional security buyers. They are residents, right? Then they form a committee when they interview the security agencies and so on. Explain outcome-based, taking another 20 minutes to tell them what the tripartite level have agreed on and so on. It's a lost cost. It's a lost cost. Mm -hmm. So why, how I go in is to explain, you get to save one day, one night officer at least. Right? So this is a language that they understand. So this would be how I would explain to a layman who does not know anything about buying security professionally. I would say that first and foremost, there will be cost savings. I think how Jeffrey has shared of mitigating the cost is absolutely, that is the crucial thing for especially residential. But I think more importantly is it's not just about cost saving, it's about getting that security outcome that we want. Right? So I just heard someone recently sharing his condo, the uh, agency raised the prices. So the MCST decided we'll just cut one officer. Settle. That lowers the cost. But actually, that is an uneducated way of redeploying security, right? So I originally had five. So I cut down to four. Problem settled. Next year, cost increase. I cut down to three. Problem settled. Next year, cost increase. I cut down to two. Problem <laughs> solved. So by the time you cut down to one, you'll realize that actually you're not solving anything at all. All you have done is pretend that there's no more problem once you cut the officer. So that I think is uh, not the best way to manage. So this is the one question on the layman. How do you explain uh, OBC to the layman? Then there's actually another related question on additional role for the SO. Huh? Would it actually scare people away, right? The SO will say, well, now I have to do extra and so on. 
That is absolutely a, a, a very good question, right? So in 2006, when NTUC uh, first started to roll out this uh, job redesign uh, program, uh, we went to hotels and we looked at the concierge, the bellhop, the security, and a few other roles, and we looked at horizontalizing their skills. So that experiment for one particular hotel failed because the security officer, the bellhop and the concierge roles were rolled into one with no salary increment, right? So it was effectively helping to offset the security or rather the hotel's shortage of manpower, but poorly executed. So when we uh, heard about it, when we talked to the, actually that was before our intervention, right? So the hotel tried to do it, no salary changes, then it just said, okay, now you can, security, you can do concerts, concerts, you can do bellhop, bellhop, you can do this. So it didn't work because for the officers who are involved, why should they do it? Extra work, right? So when we went in, we redesigned the process. The important thing that you have to get right is the incentive scheme. So if you are going to have this person do extra, first, the person must be trained for it. Second, it must be officially in his job scope. And thirdly, he must be fairly remunerated for it. Otherwise, it's a short game. After three months, you say, why should I do this? I'll go back to normally what was my duty. So the good news is, I think in Singapore, we have had good examples of buyers and security agencies that have done this and done this well. So there's one company who deploys the remote gate guarding systems in condos and all the officers are actually given a slight uh, a tap pay and allowance pay for being able to operate the remote guarding system. Then there's also another agency I visited recently they rolled out robots, a robot patrolling the premises. The officers are paid an allowance because they now learn how to maintain the robot, program the robot, and troubleshoot the robot. So as long as we are quite clear what is the job scope we want the officer to do, and we explain to the officer by doing this, you actually have more skills and we'll pay you more. Above what the PWM prescribes, I think that would be a sustainable solution. So sorry, Dex, I hijacked the, the question to answer these two uh, other questions. Uh, I return the time to you, please. Thank you. <laughs> no worry, don't no worry. I think that is a fantastic uh, explanation about what is uh, outcome-based from your perspective. And also, I, I like your sharing about that additional allowance uh, for the additional role. And tapping on that point, uh, please, we want to hear from the SA, uh, our our. Uh, uh, point this back to the SA, Kelvin, to share with us on your experience uh, about all this additional role, whether your company actually pays additional for your officers doing this additional role, uh, and also from the service buyer's side, do they actually also offer higher allowance when they ask for this additional role? Uh, maybe just to, to, to uh, answer that question, right? Uh, in general, I don't think the buyers will pay me more. Like the service <laughs> buyers would expect me to, uh, to do these uh, on my own, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's my security officers after all. Uh, I do, however, give uh, officers uh, different allowances for different skill sets that they have. So for things like, for example, uh, if they are, you know, I have some jobs which, which require me to have a walk-through metal detector um, course done, right? Uh, uh, jobs done, I pay the officers an allowance to do that. So uh, actually, um, uh, actually, Steve brought a very good point for things like uh, technology such as robots, for example, right? Uh, where we, it, actually, the, the deployment of technology is really not the difficult part. I tell you the difficult part is training the officers to use it. Many people think that the technology is, you know, it's, it's so easy, right? Why not just deploy it everywhere? The truth is the user of the technology must really use it. Right? So otherwise, you end up having a white elephant. So uh, interestingly enough, I did deploy a robot as well. I have deployed it since August last year. Uh, so far, so good. Uh, but you see, for patrolling robots, there's certain limitations, right? Uh, especially when, uh, you know, when you're trying to use it to patrol crowded places, uh, it's not going to navigate crowds very well. It's just going to end up stopping there all the time. So uh, when you want to deploy the technology, you've got to see the landscape that you're looking at, uh, the crowd that you're looking at. And of course, the training of the officers. Uh, I had a nightmare uh, trying to train my officers to use the robot. Um, it, it's not so much that they don't know how to use it. Uh, it's more like, uh, why should I do it? Like, like what Steve said, right? So, you know, end up, we, we, we went in there, we teach them how to use it. We, we told them, hey, actually, you know what? If there wasn't a robot, you actually end up doing the physical patrol yourself, you know? 
So do you want me to switch back to no 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 patrolling robot and then you do the patrol? So that that became an incentive for them to use it, lah. Uh, but I I I do agree the point that uh, officers after all will look at uh, dollars and cents, right? I mean that's what everyone's working for. So uh, I in fact when I put in technology uh, for my clients, uh, I I would always have a little bit of buffer that I can actually afford to pay the officers such allowances for this, lah. So so that's something that I would do at my own cost. I wouldn't get I wouldn't get the buyers to go and do it. Yeah, because I, I I don't think the buyers are gonna react very well when they tell them, hey, you know, my guys are gonna use the robot. Yes, you paid me X amount of money for the robot, but can you pay me a little bit more to give the allowance? It ain't gonna work. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Um, can we just wondering? So, um, do you have any service buyers that uh, spelled it up inside their contract to say they need to do this as an additional role, Maybe like what Steve has earlier me. on? Yeah. And and those job do they offer to give more allowance? So, you... so um, Dex, can I uh, yeah, sure. to answer yeah. that question? Because uh, as a buyer, you have to lay out your expectations and your requirement requirement upfront. Uh, and uh, for the buyers within uh, who are in the call, I urge you to sign up with all the various uh, seminars or training courses that are out there, either conducted by MHA, the police force or NTUC. Yeah. They are very well uh, organized and I've seen some of the materials. It tells you how to handle uh, what you need to do at pre-tender stage. I mean, briefly at pre-tender stage, uh, the first thing I need to do as a buyer is first get a management endorsement. And if it's an MCST, uh, there must be a buy-in within your council members that you are going towards uh, outcome-based. And these are the possible outcomes. Um, work with your managing agent if you are using managing agent to organize and get this uh, at least approved at the management level. Um, do market research and, and, and check around and pre-qualify suitable security agencies out there, potential ones who can offer you value services. Okay, uh, Interview them, visit their sites, visit their actual sites, how they have managed and outcome-based contracts. Okay. Um, you may have to update your specifications, your condominium or your buildings may have been upgraded, modified, or you may have added in uh, security uh, uh, enhancements in your properties. So you need to update your specifications. Um, as, you, as you build up your specification, one thing that you also need to bear in mind is how do you build up your, your, your KPIs or your KRAs that you want to measure. And in those training courses, they will tell you some very good, useful outcomes to measure. I just give, read you a few things. Uh, uh, access control. Uh, one of the performance standards is only residents and registered visitors or contractors cleared uh, allowed into the premises. Uh, maybe visitor management. Uh, all details must be recorded and must be available for review at any point of time. Okay? And there are many more of these outcomes that you want to measure. You don't want to be prescriptive. That you must go around my block three times a day and then clock in and, uh, and so on. You don't want to be prescriptive. You want to allow security agencies to exercise their know-how, deploy their technology to best give you the best outcome, the outcome you want. Then bear in mind the, like, the length of contract. Uh, uh, Kelvin won't tender for your job if it's only a one-year contract. Yeah. Bear in mind that the tenure must be enough for him to recoup his cost of deploying technology. So earlier I shared with you, in, back then when I was in Ascenders, uh, our contract was six years, uh, three plus three, which gives time for the vendor to evaluate and also invest and recoup his uh, cost. And it's a partnership that you have to build to achieve this same outcome. Um, then, of course, when you, when you want the workers or the staff to do certain things, you have to specify in your contract. For example, you want them to be trained to a certain level of competency. And, and all the essays worth their sort are required as part of licensing requirement to ensure their workers are trained at different levels of competency. In fact, this is, uh, this is enforced by MHA as part of the licensing requirement. In fact, it's getting more stringent. So you can ask for it. There are competencies that you may require them to have at least first, first line response to a defect. Okay, so if uh, Kelvin is interested to tender for his job, 
he, he will make sure his, his staff goes to NTUC Learning Hub to be trained in this area. And then he will then price accordingly. And then that part of the argument, whether I must pay or not pay, hopefully will be settled up front. Um, so, and, and also to, to be fair to any SAs, when you come into a place like this, uh, he has to survey the site, he has to evaluate the difficulties. You have to give him time to walk the ground and you have to share with them everything about your properties and be as transparent as possible. Many a times I, I've seen owners don't have plans, don't have information. And once you, you are asking them to tender in a black box with no information, Kelvin will price for, un, price for these uncertainties because he will not know how to deal with this kind of situation. So be as open and transparent in your in, in, in your in your in your in your sharing with the with the buyers. So there was a there's a question about how you manage manage performance-based contract. So, that, so once you have your performance outcome, there is probably a way for you to evaluate actual performance every month, whether they actually deliver the performance. You can ascribe a score. There are also certain mandatory things that a security agency may want to to uh, have to comply with, like licensing requirement, uh, attendance, uh, paying their, their staff on time, and all those things. Those could be statutory that you want to make sure it is done. Then you, when you add up the score, you hit a certain level of 80 points, for example, you pay him the contract value. If he hits 100 points, you want to maybe incentivize them uh, by, by giving them a little bit of uh, recognition. Uh, and this recognition, don't take it lightly. Uh, first, you must budget for it. Huh? And secondly, you have to, it, it actually, actually motivates and incentivizes the security agency and the person on the ground uh, to perform. I've seen, I've seen how security guards get very excited when they are recognized and we, we put it inside our contract that the, the incentive goes directly to the guard and not to the company. We made it a point that we must go to the guard and we want to see it being dispersed out. So we organize uh, every six months, I think Kelvin remember, uh, uh, a time where we throw a buffet and then the guards come and receive the awards. So everybody's happy. Yeah. So, so I think uh, the whole exercise of going converting may take you at least four to six months. Plan early work with your managing agent, work with your management to get this through. I, I think whatever that you put in is well, well, uh, is, is well invested, it's not wasted. But there will always be this worry that, oh, I must always go back to headcount contract. There will always be this worry that, uh, why, please manage your tenants, your residents and explain to them. Bring them down to the FCC, bring them down to the control center. Let them see for themselves. Oh, actually, uh, it's a lot more well-managed because of all this. Because pe people, people want to see the real thing. People want to touch and feel and, and, make a, and you have to make a difference. So sometimes you may have to bring some of these skeptics down to see. So look at this. Previously, the guard will be looking at 20 screens. He don't know what he's looking at. But now you see, he only looks at one screen because there's video analytics. Anything that is wrong, it pops up. Wow, you know, a picture tells a thousand words. So I think as, as owners and buyers and some of you who are here are managing agent, do that and I think you will get a lot more traction. Right, thank you, yeah. Jeffrey. Now, all those things, many of those things which Jeffrey mentioned, I think you can also obtain it from the guide on outcome-based contract. Uh, which you can easily Google it and download that document. Now, we still have about four minutes. So I think what we do is we're going to do a concluding uh, questions. Now, instead of saying all the good things that so far we have been all sharing all the good things, I'm now going to pose one question to you, okay, to every one of you, the panel here. Now, if there's one thing that you can improve uh, in the existing OBC program, uh, what will be the one thing you think you can do to improve? So one area of improvement, we have already gone through uh, all the good things we have been saying, what, what are all the good things, but is there one area that you think we can do better? Okay, one area that we can do better. Okay, probably uh, we will have a lady first. Uh. 
Anyway, Madeline also raised her hand for something to share, right? <laughs> no, I actually, I think I was clicking away and I accidentally clicked the hand, but something to share about uh, one of the questions before we round up. I saw there was a question about uh, what are the usual measure and KPI, right, that we're going to use to ensure a full security services. Actually, the measurement of KPI, there, there can be a quite a wide range, but we can refer to the MOM guide. That is a sweep of uh, CPE, we call that the contractor's uh, performance evaluation criteria that the team or the floors can actually refer to. Uh, they are touching on landscape, security services, cleaning, etc. You can take a look. I think Mr. Norman Garcia was asking the question. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, so would you also like to just uh, address my earlier questions? So what would be one area that you think the existing, we can improve in the existing OBC program? I think I do agree with one, probably one of the gentlemen or lady that actually mentioned that if prefer to have a more interactive kind of session, uh, if you can allow the floor to raise the question, you know, uh, with voice rather than type it out, it will be better. Yeah. Okay, not specific to this webinar. Yeah. It's about yeah, not OBC. specific to this yeah. webinar, maybe it has a whole for the OBC. I'm, I'm OBC talking about yeah. mm, not talking about this webinar, uh, has the OBC itself, this initiative, is there one area that you think we can that can be done to improve? Okay, this is my first time participating. Uh, I'm glad to have met all of you. And there's a very interesting sharing from Mr. Chua and uh, Kelvin and so. I felt that the whole webinar could be... Um, okay, the topic today is about sharing of the OBC. Okay, my perspective is coming from industrial and commercial. Uh, probably we can have a few more you know, segregated, segregated topics more on like uh, the four like commercial, industrial, on or, or residential to share out. It 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 be better. Okay, I think I got your point. My second. What, yeah. what? Yeah. yeah oh, Jeffrey. Jeffrey, over to you, Jeffrey. Yep. Okay, if I have my way, I would like to see uh, more done to protect the workers uh, who are doing the work. Uh, many of the OBCs, uh, we do not go down to that insist to go down to the level to ensure that the workers uh, have proper restroom area. Uh, they are, you know, they, they have their employment rights are taken care of. It's very general. It's just it must comply with the MOM guideline. Uh, I think we should be a little bit more specific in our, in our specification. Like we will want to say things like pay, uh, staff salary not later than X days uh, and, and so on. Um, you should also be as specific as possible because I think many of times we take a very easy way out to just quote a regulation and if it's not clearly it's not clearly understood by the managing agent or staff they don't go down to that level to check um, we have seen a lot of I mean we all know the essential workers the role they play I think if we really want to uplift their, their work we should provide that right working environment for them. Uh, just, a, just an anecdote, and many of you will know this. Whenever there's a change of contract, uh, very often the buyer will say, can you please keep this guard? Can you keep this guard? You know, you tell the, inc the incoming one, you know? And very often we also see the salaries of the guards come down when there's a change of contractor. So that's quite sad. Um, if, it, if, that, if that continues, then we will, or they, not just salaries, they will also lose their, their benefits. Yeah. So I think if you really think the guard is worth keeping and all those things, you may want to take care of some of this in, in, your, in your specifications up front. That, and when you're doing the tender evaluation, you might also want to be very specific in how they handle the staff transition. Okay. It's, it's, it's really right down to the operations that you need to, to make sure whatever they promise at the tender evaluation is being delivered and to safeguard the interests of the workers. Fantastic. Yeah, I, want to, I want to see more of that. Yeah, thank you. You have the security officers at heart. Huh? Okay. Thank you. So who would like to share next? Uh, Dexter, may I just ask a question? Uh, if yeah. now I'm a new buyer, where can it go to to seek like a person advised hand you know, I hold hand, we go through together, 
to push this performance base or outcome base uh, for security landscape yeah, of cleaning man, go moving to Steve, forward. Steve, go to Steve. Steve ah. okay, so Steve will be the one that <laughs> all the buyers can go to. Yeah. It's so crazy. Let's, ah. let, let, let's uh, hear from Steve. <laughs> all right. Thank you, thank you. I thought you were going to do Kelvin first. <laughs> <laughs> she directed at you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I think yes, the new uh, buyers will feel more assured you have somebody to hold hand. Yep, because yep. this is what we happen because we have Mr. Chua who already very experienced last time. He yes. let that let us through. But not all organizations have the, the kind of caliber in the organization. We really think we need to extend the help. Indeed. Whole hand. Yeah. Indeed. So uh specifically to that question, uh, first off, uh, as I mentioned, the Center for Protective Studies, which is the department within uh, the SPF. So this department's task is actually to push out. Uh, outcome-based contracting wider in Singapore, starting from public sector and then to other of the quadrants as I explained. So first and foremost, if you need to know what is OBC, the outreach events conducted by CPS is a very, very good place to start. Then as Dex has mentioned, as Jeffrey has mentioned, there, is, there are actually online material or materials online that you can actually download. The outcome-based security uh, guidebook, uh, which we have uploaded, uh, I think, two years or three years ago when we launched the ITM, is also another place to start. So that's for awareness. But second point, which Madeline mentioned, very, very crucial, not every organization has a Jeffrey Chua. So how do we solve this? Huh? So we have been working as an industry to ramp up the number of consultants in the industry. Right. So the people who are very, very good at this Either you have someone like Jeffrey Chua, a deep domain expert within your organization, or you actually hire someone, a consultant who actually, not the pencha type, huh, but the properly rated one by the police force, uh, which uh, will actually know what to look at, how to conduct a TBRA, installing the right tech, and then leveraging the manpower. So the good news is, I think uh, it was announced that the Private Security Industry Act will be uh, updated, right? So the PSIB, the bill itself is going through Parliament for the second reading next Monday, I think. Uh, the intention, one of it, amongst other changes, is to actually allow the industry to now certify the consultants coming online. So SAS, uh, which uh, Kel uh, whom Kelvin is part of, as well as AXA, will be in charge of ratifying these consultants. This is good, because I think the more consultants that are available for us to choose from, the better chances that you can get a good consultant to work, work with you for the four to six months to implement, to transform your contract from a manpower to one to an outcome-based one. It is actually fairly common. If you look at BCA, right, they regulate, for example, qualified persons, QP, for construction projects or certain uh, important works. Uh. So the consultant, in our case, works as the QP, right? Qualified person to tell you that this is the right way to do and this is the outcome that you will get from doing this. So that's the uh, second part of it. Then the third part of it is uh, we will endeavor to continue to organize these seminars. And I take that uh, suggestion uh, that uh, maybe Sam's uh, colleagues, we can explore whether on a platform wise, other than Zoom, uh, are we able to have a virtual interactive so that uh, everybody can interact with whoever they want uh, at the same time, rather than sitting here in a one big room uh, I think that's one possibility. Lah. So we'll take that back. Okay, so now I come to Dex's ask of the panel, right? So for our comment. So first off, for the seminar, my wish is we have more time, right? So I think it, uh, I think there's a lot of expertise here around the room and uh, it is a pity that uh, we don't have enough time to pull it through. But I hope that all the questions that are asked here can actually be circulated maybe to the panel for us to give our thoughts. Huh? And then we can circulate to the participants as well, just to close the loop, because I think we didn't have enough time to cover all the questions, right? So specific now, finally, to the question that you asked, right? So what can we do for the security industry, specifically for OBC? Uh? My personal wish, if I had a magic wand, uh, is this. There are good security officers, and there are officers who obviously need to improve. This is similarly the case for security agencies, where they are very good at agencies, then there are also agencies that actually needs to be uh, needs to raise their standards. But we must also say the same of buyers. There are buyers, there are very, very good buyers, very enlightened buyers, ascenders being an example, where you actually plan ahead and work with the agencies to say a three plus three contract allows you to properly amortize your capex, which is very, very important. 
The moment you charge CAPEX into OPEX, uh, it gives you all sorts of pro problems downstream. So I think that that first, uh, that, that, uh, the role that buyers play is absolutely critical. So my wish is if I could, with a ferry one, connect the best buyers with the best agencies, with the best officers, I think we will have half the problem solved. <laughs> Uh, so the difficulty is when we are mixing and matching. Uh, sometimes you have a good buyer with the best intent. He bumps into an agency who does not understand the intent and tries to bend the system. Then you have a problem. Then you have a problem. And then OBC haven't even start. I think they say, nah, it's bullshit one, right? I don't believe. So that becomes a problem. So uh, that is my wish. And uh, thanks uh, to... Uh, uh, our panel and our audience for giving me the chance to share my thoughts. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Uh, it sounds like something you can do. Uh, this. <laughs> okay, over to Kelvin. Uh, okay, well, uh, if there's really one thing that I wish we could do for outcome-based contracting uh, to make it really better, I, I think outcome-based contracting uh, is, is really not picking up because I think a lot of buyers don't even know how to get started, right? Uh, I think it's really the tendering phase that they, they, they can't even come out with the documents because they don't even know what they want. So, uh, well, I echo the points that uh, Steve brought up earlier. I think it's about having the consultants to really guide the buyers who really want to procure uh, contracts through OBC properly. Uh, at, you know, they, 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 they need to get themselves linked up to the right consultants to go through it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Kelvin. And uh, I'd like to thank all the panelists here for your very interactive and uh, insightful sharings. And thanks to all the audience for all your questions. Uh, I would like to end this session. Um, but of course, before we conclude our webinar today, I would now like to welcome uh, Mr. Cha Wai Hong, the project director from SAMS who will share with us an introduction to the Safety and Security Asia 2021. Um, Chia, are you around? Hi. Uh, okay, thank you, uh, Dex. Uh, and thank you to all our distinguished speakers for their earlier presentation in this webinar. Let me just share the screen. Just hold on a second. Ah, okay, got it. Okay, <laughs> Safety and Security Asia 2021. Uh, this is an event that has been held since 1991 and is an established platform, an established and proven platform for product suppliers, technology vendors and solution and service providers to gain access to business opportunities as well as to further learn the trends in the security industry in Singapore and the region, especially in the new normal. SSA 2021, the 19th event in the series, will be organized as a hybrid event with the physical event to be held at Marina Bay Sands, Singapore, 24th to 26th November. The virtual event will be online for one month from 10 November to 9 December. As highlighted here, the event is only open to those who have been vaccinated. In addition, the event will be organized under prevailing strict safe management measures protocol. SSA 2021 is organized as part of uh, Architecture and Building Services 2021, a conglomerate of seven synergistic trade shows catering to the whole built environment value chain. Is co-located with three other trade shows closely related to safety and security industry, namely Fire and Disaster Asia, WorkSafe Asia, and iFame, which is an international facility management expo. On the next slide, you would see all our partners involved in SSA 2021. As you can see from here, the event is supported by practically the whole security industry in Singapore. And this would include those from the vendor side, as well as those from the buyer side. Event highlights. 
On this slide, we would like to point out the various highlights. This would consist of, first of all, the three security conferences which we are organizing over three days of the event. This would include, of course, uh, a more detailed discussion on outcome-based security contracting organized jointly with USE and AXA. And the second security conference will be ACES International Annual Conference. And then we have the Security Industry Institute Masterclass. In addition, there will be two conferences organized for facility managers, building owners, MCSTs, and so on. Besides these five conferences, there will be an additional five conferences organized for the built environment industry. At SSA 2021, special products pavilions are also being organized covering OBC products and services, and also for robotics, UAV and automation. On this slide, uh, we would like to highlight the 10 concurrent conferences being lined up for, the, uh, for ABS 2021. The three security conferences lined up are highlighted in dark blue here. The two FM conferences in light blue, whereas the five built environment conferences are highlighted in yellow. As you can see, uh, there will be one security conference on each day of the event. The outcome-based uh, security conference will be on day three, 26 November. Next is the layout of the whole event. This is on halls E and F at Marina Bay Sands. On the plan, we have highlighted in yellow the zone where Safety and Security Asia 2021 is located. Surrounding the exhibition hall are the three conference halls. Such a layout would maximize exhibitors and conference attendees' interaction. Also highlighted in pink on the left side is conference room one where the OBC conference will be held on day three. On this slide, we would like to highlight the key participation benefits. This is especially for vendors. Of these, the two most unique benefits would be, first of all, the event offers a ready captive audience of some 1,500 security professionals, security agencies, system integrators, facility and building managers, building owners, MCSTs, attending the five security and FM conferences. And second, we offer companies the opportunity to exhibit in a trade show organized in partnership with the whole security industry for the security industry. The longest running security trade show in Southeast Asia, and also the one and only security trade show in Singapore in 2021. On the next slide, uh, these are various options to participate in SSA 2021. For exhibitors, there are three ways, as a hybrid exhibitor, as a physical exhibitor, or as a virtual exhibitor. For Singapore registered companies, please take note that there is an official Singapore pavilion with funding of 70% for first time exhibitors, as well as for previous exhibitors, which have participated three times or less in previous safety and security Asia's. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you for attending the SSA 2021 presentation, as well as the security webinar. For more information on SSA, uh, you can reach out to me at uh, 65968901529 or email to chia at sams.com.sg. See you at SSA 2021. That is all for this presentation. Thank you again for your attendance and have a good evening. Back to you, Dex. Okay, thank you, Chia. Ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of this outcome-based contracting in the new normal webinar. Organized by SAMS and USC, and we hope that you have benefited much from it. And here's my final thoughts. The only constant is change. We live in a world of volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. Our progress must not be impeded by this VUCA. We must persevere, and we will 